these and take them into consideration when we're planning future webinars. Um, so with that, I just um, want to pass it over to Dina to get us started. Thank you so much, Kayla. I really appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. So excited to have you on for our December webinar, the last Connect Home USA webinar of the year. Happy holidays, everyone. Um, as I like to say, it takes a village to close the digital divide, and libraries are an important part of that village. I know a lot of you work with your local library. So today, we're very lucky to have Libraries Without Borders U.S talk about their work, provide best practices and case studies to give you more ideas about how to best engage the libraries in your areas, and even to access the resources that they themselves offer um, that are available to you. Um, before I introduce our speakers, uh, I'd like to take a special moment to recognize Kayla Prendergast for all the incredible work she's done planning and managing our webinar series for the past two years. We've done a webinar a month, basically, uh, for the past two years, and she's been both a great thought partner and great, as you can see, at the actual logistics of managing the webinars. Um, so she not only manages the platform, but she helps troubleshoot while the webinar is going on for people trying to log on. She manages the chat box and much more, I'm sure, that we just don't see. Um, so Kayla, thank you so much for, for all of your great work. Um, for our audience, I, I want to say the reason I'm saying this is because our contract with Enterprise is ending. So this will be the last webinar we do with Kayla. Um, so I wanted to make sure to acknowledge her for the great work she's done. Um, we will continue to offer webinars in the new year, and we'll share more about that when they become available. So thank you for that. And now um, let me introduce our speakers. So we're very lucky to have Aaron Greenberg, who is the Executive Director of Libraries Without Borders U.S. Uh, previously, he managed workforce development programs, COVID-19 relief, and uh, electoral campaigns for the Hospitality Workers Union, Unite Here Local 11 in Southern California and Arizona. While earning his PhD in political science at Yale University, he served three terms on New Haven City Council representing the 8th Ward. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, and next, we'll also hear from Kat Trujillo, who is the Deputy Director of Libraries Without Borders U.S., where she has spent the past five years launching pop-up libraries in Baltimore, Detroit, those are two Connect Home USA communities, by the way, the Bronx, Oakland, San Antonio, another Connect Home community, Ecuador and Puerto Rico, those do not yet have Connect Home sites. <laughs> Previously, she worked to advance educational equity and opportunity at the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, National Head Start Association, and hum Humanity in Action. Born and raised in South Central LA, Kat is a proud Cal alum and a lifelong Angeleno. With that, I will pass it to Erin. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I am going to kick us off, actually. So thank you, Dina, for that wonderful introduction, and thank um, all of you for joining us um, at today's webinar. So as Dina mentioned, I'm Kat Trujillo, and I'm joined by my colleague, Erin Greenberg, and we're here to tell you a little bit about the strategies that our organization, Libraries Without Borders, has used to engage public libraries and other organizations working to promote digital inclusion across the country. So before I dive into our national work, I'd like to give you a brief history of our organization. So we were founded in 2007 um, in Paris uh, as Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, Libraries Without Borders. And since then, we've worked tirelessly to promote equitable access to learning and information resources. And we've done this all over the world, from refugee camps in Burundi to demobilization zones in Colombia, to homeless shelters on the outskirts of Paris, and even laundromats in major cities across the US. Next slide. For nearly two decades, we've developed innovative tools and training techniques that allow, to, allow us to meet people where they are and provide them with resources that they need to fully participate in society. Next slide. Some of those tools are featured here. Uh, the very colorful box on the left is the Ideas box, 
which is a pop-up library and multimedia center that we use in refugee camps and um, humanitarian emergency contexts. In the middle, we have the Ideas Cube, which is a portable digital library. And next to that, we have Kaju, which is a social enterprise tech that we use to distribute quality digital content offline all over the world. Internationally, Libraries Without Borders has been able to reach 1.5 million people in over 50 countries. In the US, we've had a comparable impact, albeit scaled, <laughs> um, which I'll let my colleagues tell you more about um, next. Thank you. Yes, so in the US, where we've been operating for the last 10 years, we have, uh, as we'll discuss shortly, created pop-up libraries, uh, multimedia hubs, and community resource uh, centers that extend library services in um, cities from Oakland to San Antonio to Loisa in Puerto Rico to Detroit and Baltimore. Overall, as Kat mentioned, around the world, our organization has deployed over 140 Ideas Box kits in 52 countries with materials in 26 languages. Uh, next slide. So whether we work in refugee camps or laundromats or church basements or community centers, uh, the work that we do is the same everywhere. We work to transform underutilized spaces into connected learning places. We partner with residents and constituents, with public libraries, with community-based organizations. We work to build the capacity of local leaders in the communities where we're working. And we create welcoming, functional spaces that meet the needs of a community and that feature the kinds of materials and resources from books and technology to internet connectivity that allow constituents, that allow residents to uh, fully engage and navigate a very changing world. And that often does involve digital literacy and connectivity and broadband in particular. Once a space uh, is set up, we facilitate community-centered programming. We start with the needs of the community. We survey the community. We understand with community leaders what kinds of programming from health literacy to story time for kids, what kind of programming is going to be um, most appropriate and most necessary to meet the needs of residents and community members. Uh, next slide. So in our work across the country, wanted to provide just a few examples of the partners that we have worked with to help create connected learning places to help transform uh, spaces from laundromats to church basements to community centers into uh, resource centers. So in Maryland, we work with the Enoch Pratt Free Public Library, the Cash Campaign, Digital Harbor Foundation, Esperanza Center. In Minnesota, with the Albert Lee Public Library, the Anoka County Public Library, Hillcrest Community Cooperative, Park Plaza Cooperative, in Texas with Bibliotech and Goodwill, the Office of Innovation, San Antonio Public Library, and in Puerto Rico, Link PR, US Ignite, uh, it's an organization I know some folks on the call are familiar with, with the Information Technology Disaster Center, and with Pinones Aprende y Emprende um, as well. So you can see uh, from these examples, which we'll discuss in just a few minutes, the wide range of partners that we work with from uh, public libraries to community-based organizations to uh, library services organizations like Bibliotech uh, to long-standing um, direct service organizations like Goodwill, and then in Minnesota uh, with uh, house, low-income housing cooperatives um, and their boards. So we are a, a nimble organization, we are adaptable, and we work with partners of many different kinds from you know institutional incumbents like public libraries to uh, grassroots organizations 
uh, across the country. Uh, next slide. Great. So we work in spaces where there are opportunities to provide uh, learning materials and resources for underserved communities. Laundromats, community centers, low-income housing, uh, given some uh, situations around COVID, some of our work has now gone from laundromats and community centers to the outdoors, so public parks, neighborhood gardens, parking lots, church functions. Again, we are nimble and adaptable and do everything we can working with community partners to meet the needs of community members, constituents, and residents. And we have, over many years, learned how to uh, transform ordinary or neglected or underused and underutilized spaces into um, library and learning spaces where there are resources and opportunities for people of all ages. Uh, so next, I'm going to pass it over to uh, my colleague, to Kat, who will take us through some examples of our interventions in various kinds of spaces, starting with laundromats. Thanks, Erin. Um, so yes, one of our most successful programs has been our work in laundromats. Think about it. Working families spend hundreds of hours every year at the laundromat. And for years, LWB Libraries of Borders, we've partnered with local libraries, um, nonprofits, and community based organizations, as well as small business owners, to transform laundromats into places where uh, community members can learn and obtain resources. The idea is really simple. Uh, instead of watching the dryer or having kids run around because they are bored out of their minds and don't know what to do, families and children are able to access carefully curated resources, um, which include books and digital content curated by our library partners. And this allows the laundromat to become a place for learning and fun. And through those partnerships that I mentioned, specifically the ones with public libraries, we've also been able to connect laundromat patrons with resources that can help them um, do things like find a job, apply for rental assistance, seek legal aid, and even sign up for affordable broadband internet at home. Um, we've been able to do this in, oh, and actually, if we can go back to the previous, uh, yes, this one, great. Oh, no, sorry, we were on the right one. Um, I just got confused the picture, yes. So here, actually, I'm, um, going to tell you a bit about um, what these three pictures are showing you. The first one is one of the uh, laundromats that we uh, work in Baltimore. And here um, we were able to create a mini computer lab, um, which is open to all of the laundromat patrons, but became particularly popular with uh, some of the middle school ch uh, kids. And actually, um, one of the days that I was I was there, there was a little boy who came in with a folder and a notebook, and he had written out um, in pencil his book report, and he needed to submit it online because, um, every, you know, everything was digital, and he'd come to the laundromat specifically so that he could transfer his book report um, into a Word doc and then email it to his teacher. Um, in the middle, we have one of my favorite librarians, Kamisha Goss. Um, in Detroit at one of our other laundromat sites hosting story time for two kids. Um, and so her, uh, so Q and uh, Miss Jolly would switch off um, hosting story time and uh, engaging children in early learning activities. And I want to emphasize that we don't um, just set up these spaces for children, although children are often the most photogenic <laughs> subjects, so we have a lot of pictures with kids. Um, and then the third one, um, it's a, a site, uh, one of the laundromats we have in St. Paul. Um, it's called Beautiful Laundrette. And um, here we have a, a little boy who was being taught how to draw, uh, draw hippopotamus. Um, so the resources can really vary according to the needs of the community. Um, and these three communities depicted here 
uh, there was a clear need for early childhood education and learning resources, literacy, um, and digital literacy. Next slide. Um, so we also work in community centers. Um, those community centers, or that term is very loosely defined, um, but in Puerto Rico in particular, um, we have been able to transform um, abandoned uh, buildings into places that community members of all ages um, can use. Um, and pictured here is uh, La 23, which is one of our, um, one of the community centers where um, we've actually taken the building itself. Um, and this didn't happen overnight. It's been <laughs> relationships that we've built over many years, um, but we've been able to um, essentially um, re revamp, remodel the space, um, make it uh, a warm and welcoming uh, place where all uh, community members can come and engage in various activities. Um, it's a bit different context here because uh, we don't have a specific library partner. Um, the library system is a bit different um, in Puerto Rico. And so we've worked with uh, the network of the National Library of Medicine to provide health literacy content and um, as well as uh, other local partners uh, focused on digital literacy. Um, but there's also a huge emphasis on arts and culture um, and working with kids uh, in STEM, using video games uh, to, to promote uh, some digital literacy skills, and also the arts, um, so really engaging children and adults um, in a number of activities. And we also had a digital literacy workshop specifically for um, older adults. Um, so that they could have their neighborhood council meetings. Um, so they could use laptops and schedule meetings and um, apply for a number of different grants, um, you know, on their own. And our goal was really, we don't want to um, be the, the go-to person for all things. We want to make sure that uh, we equip folks um, with the skills they need to, to do this beyond, you know, our immediate intervention. Um, next slide. So we also work in uh, low-income housing, and uh, one of the biggest uh, or types of uh, low-income housing that we work in um, is manufactured housing communities. Um, there are a ton of people, I think 22 million people that are living in manufactured housing communities across the country. And uh, this is you know, the largest sector of non-subsidized affordable housing in the country. Um, a lot of residents that we've worked with in particular um, are single mothers, recent immigrants, young families on limited income, um, retirees, veterans. So uh, the programming that we offer um, is very, very different depending again on the community, but uh, we've been very fortunate to work closely with our library partners, um, specifically in Fridley, Minnesota, and also um, in Clarks Grove, Minnesota. And there, um, our partnerships with the Albert Lee Public Library, um, has, uh, ha that partnership has enabled us to host virtual story time, had to be virtual because of the pandemic, um, as well as a hotspot lending program and a back to school computer giveaway. Um, we were also, um, before the pandemic, hosting in-person uh, story time, uh, and that was through the Anoka County Library, as well as ESL classes um, for residents. Next slide, please. Um, partnership opportunities. I'll pass it to you, Erin. Great. So over the last uh, 10 years that we've been working in the U.S., and that our parent organization has been working abroad, uh, we've learned a lot about how to really uh, both provide the tools and work with partners and then uh, engage community members, engage stakeholders and constituents uh, with the tools once they exist. And so we want to talk briefly and then leave lots of time for uh, questions and conversation about some potential ways that we could partner with uh, your housing authority on different projects to help fulfill the mission of Connect Home and to bridge the digital divide 
um, in HUD properties across the country. And I'll say, as Dina mentioned at the beginning uh, of the hour, my background in local politics in New Haven exposed me to a lot of the incredible work that housing authorities uh, do on a daily basis. I represented uh, a few major housing authority properties in New Haven and got an opportunity to uh, work with residents and work with um, the housing authority there. And so really close to my heart for us to be able to have the opportunity to, um, to potentially work with uh, additional housing authorities across the country. So one way that we can partner with your public housing authority would be on resources for outreach and resident engagement. Um, as, as you all know, putting a, a tool, especially a, a technical tool or a digital tool um, in a housing authority uh, building or in a place does not guarantee that it's going to be used. And what we've learned over many years is how to uh, really teach digital literacy to um, expand access and to meet people where, they're, where they are on the ways in which they might need to use technology. So resident engagement is one opportunity. Uh, another related to that is best practices for digital liter literacy program delivery, facilitator training, so for your staff who are working to implement uh, programs to bridge the digital divide, we can offer uh, consultancy and other kinds of um, programs based on best practices that we've developed from our time uh, turning places where people uh, work and where people, oops, sorry, I think I just cut out for a second, um, places where people live um, into uh, opportunities for learning and um, and for learning resources. Then uh, we can help to install and activate tools that will make shared spaces, um, places for learning, so through human-centered design and creative placemaking, be that the kind of work that we've done in laundromats to turn really corners of retail businesses into adjuncts of the library, or the work that we've done internationally to install uh, pop-up libraries like the Ideas Box in refugee camps, um, in homeless shelters, and in other unusual um, spaces and places. Finally, we can offer training and technical assistance for libraries and other digital inclusion partners like Connect Home. So given our experience uh, rolling out offline internet tools like Kaju or the Ideas Cube, uh, or also the offline and online capabilities of the Ideas Box, uh, as well as our work uh, turning laundromats and other spaces into uh, places of learning. We have a lot of um, ways in which we can uh, teach and share best practices with you and your team. Uh, next slide. Okay, so thank you so, so much. Uh, we are really looking forward to answering your questions um, and to the discussion. Uh, we'd love to talk about any more of the case studies in detail and get your, your feedback and ideas about how we can work together. and Kat, that was great. This is Gina. Um, so for, for folks who uh, have questions, uh, Kayla, I'll let you remind folks how to do that. Yes, sorry, I was, I was double muted on my phone and on the computer, so no I was worries, doing no. my whole spiel. <laughs> um, but anyway, yes, thanks, Erin and Kat. That was a really great overview of, of y'all's organization and all the great work that you're doing. And I think we can really see the, the synergy between the Connect Home program and Libraries Without Borders. Um, so just a reminder to all of our attendees, uh, you can send your questions to me in the chat or you can raise your hand or, um, you know, let me know 
if you want me to unmute your line, we can do it that way as well. Um, but I, I do have a few questions that came into the chat while you were presenting, so I'll just start with those um, and we'll go, we'll go from there. Uh, so first question, um, how would a PHA start the process of creating an on-site library? Um, well, we uh, would suggest that you reach out to us. Um, there are a number of tools that we've created to help um, help you do that. Um, we have, I know toolkits are very popular. They're very in these days. And we also have a toolkit um, that provides step-by-step -step, um, guidance um, based on our experiences from um, developing partnerships. And it's and actually, I was looking at the Connect Home uh, playbook and um, I think it's a, a complementary resource in many ways. Um, uh, but we also have things like a placemaking rubric, um, and these are all freely available. Um, we just would love, you know, to be in touch with you and also kind of guide you or uh, support you through the process. And I think our emails um, were shared or will be shared at some point. Yeah, I think they're on this screen right here, so I'll just go back. Yeah. Um, and you okay, I'll, I'll leave this up for a bit as we get more questions. I can Great. add to that, um, and I know I, I don't think I appear as online anymore. I'm having some technical difficulties, but fortunately I've dialed in, so I'm on an analog line. Um, yeah, I would say that reaching out to us would be a great way to start the conversation. Um, our, our tools and techniques that we've honed over time are relatively uh, cost efficient, and we work with partners on the ground with community organizations to locate funding. Um, and to make sure that we can do these projects in a really like lean and, and effective way. So, um, you know, we can obviously talk more offline if you're interested about uh, the cost of something like an ideas box or the installs that we've done in various uh, places and spaces. But, um, uh, you know, we've, we've learned to, to operate very uh, efficiently over time. Awesome, thanks. Um, so just following up on that, um, Kat, do you have a link or, or sort of instructions on how someone would access the Y'all's Toolkit? Um, yes, um, I can put it in the chat um, right okay. now. Perfect. So there's a, there's a website version, and this one is specific to the work we did in Laundromats, but a lot of the um, the suggestions are still relevant. Um, we are creating a um, like a general version of this um, soon, and that will be posted on our website. Okay, awesome. Uh, thanks. I see it in the chat now. So next question: um, How would you become a partner? Uh, we have a partnership with the library and two Envision centers. That would be perfect. Um, for an extended partnership with Libraries Without Borders. Anything that you could provide about the process of becoming a partner would be helpful. So just just to see, you know, just so I just quickly interject, an Envision Center is a is a program that was um, stood up under the prior administration and is a like a one stop shop that that, that several PHAs have um, adopted where they bring multiple resources from multiple organizations locally in one place under one roof. So just some background for you, Kat. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but really the best way to or the yeah, the best place to start is reaching out to us um, and setting up an introductory call so that we can get to know you, your organization, um, the uh, library, your library partners, and um, figure out if this is going to be a good fit. And it may be that, um, you know, we're able to, to provide some of the uh, setup guidance. It may be that we become uh, implementing partners, and we, as Aaron mentioned, can pursue funding to um, grow the program, um, but it really has to start with that introductory call. I don't know, Aaron, if there's anything you want to add to that. Um, yeah, I, I think that though we, we do similar kinds of work in many different kinds of places, uh, at the end of the day, we want to customize everything that we do in terms of the content and the design to the space and um, to the community. I know 
thinking back to, again, my time working uh, with public housing residents in my ward, you know, the, the kinds of materials and also the kind of space that uh, would we be able to work with in a building where there were mostly older residents was pretty different than one where there were a lot of families. Um, the, ge the geography of the, um, of the buildings were, were different, where people gathered, where and what kind of space you might be using for a program like this is different. And of course, the, the contents are different too and the different co the partners on the ground that we might have identified to, uh, to work with and do programming and workshops would differ. So uh, the best way yeah, is to, to start with the conversation with us and uh, see where we can be helpful. Great, thanks both of you. Um, next is, um, I wonder, have you found that all the computers have been safe even while staff are not present? Generally, yes, although there are always um, exceptions. Um, one of the ways that we've been able to mitigate the um, risk of things being stolen or taken um, is by having community buy-in from the very beginning. Um, so we uh, find interactive ways to engage the community in, in like what tables and chairs do you want? What color um, do you want uh, the rug to be? So the space is very much um, owned by the community and the technology as a part of that space, um, you know, is, is seen as um, a common, you know, good. Uh, we do take certain precautions um, with uh, very basic like safety mechanisms, um, locks, but uh, it's, it's very rare that the technology is taken. I think it's only happened two or three times since we've been doing this. And I yeah, think it's that community buy-in. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, on the community buy-in, that really starts um, even before we arrive to do any kind of install, we are working with community members on rolling out surveys, uh, on you know talking to the uh, folks in the neighborhood or in the building or the complex where we might be uh, doing the install to make sure that what we're that the services that we're providing are ones that people might want and so that we're really from the start um, engaging the community in in an open process uh, with both door-to-door -door kinds of surveying and canvassing and then uh, community meetings and listening sessions as well. Okay, so I think that leads nicely into another question that we got. Um, can you describe what participant participation at the pop-up libraries is like, um, you know, sort of starting with when you started and up till now, um, how do you promote or encourage participation? Um, going back to uh, the last question, because we involve community members in the design, um, we know that the programming and activities will reflect um, what they actually, like their interests. So, um, for instance, we originally started almost exclusively focused on early childhood education and um, literacy, um, and we found that not every community, you know, has demographics that make uh, where that makes sense. Um, so, by working with our library partners in particular um, and other community um, organizations, we identified um, existing um, services. So, for instance, there's a social worker in the library that we work with um, in Baltimore uh, through the Enoch Pratt Free Library. And that's, uh, that's a service that was uh, provided exclusively, I believe, in the library, but then uh, was something that we were able to offer in one of our laundromats. And similarly, whether it's in a manufactured housing community, we're able to tailor the uh, programming to the community interests. And there's the only other piece is, is it offered at a time when um, it's convenient and when um, folks are actually able to participate and they're not, not um, working or um, otherwise occupied. Um, and so the timing has been uh, a learning process. Uh, sometimes folks think that they're available at a certain time and 
um, when we get started, it turns out that that's not actually convenient or no longer convenient. Um, so trying to also provide asynchronous, you know, um, programming and resources, things that folks can pick up um, at their convenience and making uh, making clear signage um, and announcements and communicating when uh, there will be drop-in uh, for different uh, services like the social worker in the library or like text prep or rental assistance. Uh, so trying to provide multiple ways so that people can remain engaged even if they can't um, sit down in a ESL workshop on a Thursday night, but they're able to know that they can drop in on a Saturday morning. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, I got a clarifying question. Um, I just want to clarify if we, if through partnering with you, we'll also be partnering with a local library. Um, can you clarify kind of what that relationship looks like? Sure. Um, so we always, 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 always try to work with public libraries because they're such an incredible um, resource, anchor institutions, they, they, they do it all. Um, but that's not always possible. Sometimes uh, the, library, uh, the librarians that we're working with uh, don't feel comfortable working in certain spaces. And so a lot of the training techniques that we develop are focused around building capacity and confidence in um, these non-traditional non -traditional spaces like laundromats, um, but there are others. Um, and once uh, librarians go through these trainings, um, it's often a matter of okay, like let's get started and let's let's uh, let's start programming. Um, but if there isn't, um, you know, uh, if there isn't capacity in terms of just human resources at all, um, because of funding or for a number of other reasons, or um, the public library is not um, actually, you know, nearby. Um, then we try to identify alternative organizations that we can work with, but we always try to work with with public libraries. Okay, awesome, thank you. So I think you maybe covered this already, but I'm just gonna ask again to be triple positive. Um, do you have to convert a laundry room into a pop-up library or is there an opportunity to do this at a separate community area? Thanks. Anywhere, yeah, anywhere. Um, the laundromat uh, program that we operate is one of the most popular because um, I think it's easy to understand, but really we can transform any space um, into a pop-up library or learning place or community engagement space. Yeah, okay. I would and add, so, especially okay. in the, oh, in the age of, of, uh, of COVID, where we're doing work outdoors, uh, you know, depending on, on climate, we can also do um, this kind of engagement outdoors with something like uh, the Ideas Box, uh, which is a, you know, a portable library that can, um, that can be assembled in 15 or 20 minutes that has computers, tablets, books, a screen, a projector to make a movie theater basically, and a tent and tables and chairs. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful and like beautifully designed um, portable library that could be set up indoors or outdoors. And if there's not a dedicated indoor space uh, to be a community resource or learning center all the time, um, you can set this up, disassemble it, and roll it into the corner. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna group a couple questions here, mostly about funding and grant opportunities. Um, so are there direct funding or grant opportunities through Libraries Without Borders? And to follow that up, um, does Libraries Without Borders provide equipment? Um, and at what cost would this be to the Housing Authority? Uh, I can take that um, and then um, whatever I whatever I miss, Kat will uh, will add in. I I think again it depends on the particular needs that um, and the space that a housing authority has in a building or in buildings. 
um, I'll say that in the housing, uh, low income housing we've worked at before in Minnesota, we have done trans transformative work in common spaces for around fifty to seventy five thousand dollars total, though it's been less, again, depending on exactly the needs, the tech, the furniture, et cetera. Um, other options will vary in terms of the technical tools that we have, but at the end of the day, when we work with a partner, uh, we work with that partner to find funding, whether they or their organization has some funding they can match or with um, community foundations, family foundations, um, local, state, federal funds, um, so that it's not um, going to be a burden for the partner to be able to participate. Um, I'll hand it over to Kat if there's anything that I missed there. Yeah, no, I, th I think you, you captured it well. We really, um, we really want to work closely with our partners to identify funding um, and to provide the most cost efficient um, model. So with technology or training, um, but we don't ourselves give grants. Okay, thanks for that clarifying point. Um, Next question, can communities purchase the toolbox that you mentioned? Oh, the ideas box. Um, so yes. we, yeah. we don't um, sell the ideas box itself. It's um, a tool that we integrate into um, programs. Um, so it's not um, like an item that you can purchase. Erin, I don't know if you want to elaborate on, on that. Yeah, I hate to sound like a broken record, but if you're, <laughs> if you're interested, you should reach back out to us and we can uh, we can definitely look into what the use would be and, um, you know, we're, we haven't traditionally done that, but um, we're open to talking about it for sure. Awesome, thank you. Next question, um, any suggestions to deter parents from using this as childcare slash do you limit occupancy or use adult or teen volunteers? Thanks. Um, we have in the past worked um, with high school students um, who uh, helped us uh, in one of the programs we were running in the Bronx. Um, they wanted to get some leadership training and public speaking training, and we wanted um, some folks to help introduce community members to the pop-up library space. Um, so in the past, we have partnered um, with young people, and uh, we also worked with um, some college students, uh, but we can't really do anything in terms of um, whether or not parents treat it, I guess, as, as child care, um, because we, we keep our resources um, available, um, you know, as long as the space is available. So if it's a laundromat or a community uh, center in, um, in, a for, in a public housing uh, building, we, you know, we work with that community to set the terms of when resources will be um, open to all, but um, we don't have any limits uh, other than that um, in terms of tech use or or even availability of books or digital content. Yeah, this is something we'd want to, in the housing authority context, work with the the resident council um, or other um, you know resident organization on terms and on you know ensuring, like we were talking about before, uh, measures to prevent um, theft or loss and and to ensure buy-in and engagement in a healthy way. Okay, awesome. Um, so can you talk about some of the struggles or challenges you've witnessed from your collaborations? Um, I know you haven't worked directly with housing authorities, uh, but you've worked with similar organizations. So just, you know, overall struggles or challenges that you've faced. Well, early on, I, I um, will admit that we um, were trying to integrate technology into all of our, our projects and, um, making assumptions um, about how that technology would be used. I think the biggest learning has been 
starting with the community members and and they're like i want to learn how to talk to my grandkids and maybe that's the connection to the technology piece not that we're going to offer computer basics or computer skills 101 um, and expect that people will <laughs> will be um, running to sign up it's it's really about making those practical connections uh, to the things that matter to to community members um, so that they're um, eager to participate and not making assumptions about, uh, you know, there's a one size fits all tool or training technique or model that will work. It, uh, early on, I think there was the temptation to, to say, like, we have the one model or we have the one tool. And as you can tell from our presentation, we have um, like a catalog, you know, we have a, a tool box and there are a number of tools that we can um, suggest, but not all of them will make sense. And that's the biggest takeaway. And it happened, you know, very um, early <laughs> in our in our um, in our time as an organization. Steep learning curve for us, but that's why we are where we are today. Okay. The next one. Um... How do you identify communities to work with? Are there specific criteria that you look for? Or is it on a case-by-case -case basis? Um, we often get approached by communities. Um, so to date, it has been a lot of, um, of uh, either community leaders or librarians that hear about our work um, and you know, setting up those introductory conversations and, and figuring out if it's possible to get started. Um, but we're we're open. We're open. Uh, there isn't. Uh, yeah, there isn't. Uh, we're we're not uh, prospecting <laughs> necessarily, but we're always open to inquiries uh, for folks who want to uh, explore a partnership. Yeah, I would say that the two very like l loose. Um, criteria for a successful collaboration, especially with a housing authority, would be for there to be some space, indoors or outdoors, that could be even temporarily transformed to become uh, a connected learning place or a you know pop-up library. And the second would be uh, a relatively high level of community engagement and organization uh, where there is for instance, like an active, um, you know, resident council um, or other, you know, community leaders um, in and, and resident leaders in the um, in a housing authority um, community that would be uh, willing to to work with us and help to uh, strategize around engagement. We want to make sure that that residents are really involved from, from the get-go. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so we have about seven minutes left and a few more questions in the chat. So I think we're, we're just gonna keep on rolling. Uh, the next one, I'm gonna group into one. Uh, they're in sort of a similar subject area. So um, first question. Being in a senior citizen complex has unique needs. What are some areas that you've seen addressed in this specific demographic? Do you have any tips on working with um, senior housing? Hello. Um, so we, we have worked um, with um, a number of senior communities, not specifically in a senior citizen uh, complex. Um, and a lot of um, that work has involved um, trial and error conversations and um, iterative <laughs> program design. Um, obviously, safety, accessibility, those are key considerations. Um, we want to make sure that um, that when we're hosting programming um, or any activities that it's a, that um, we host those in a space that um, that is accessible by all um, and um, we also work um, to um, survey um, residents 
um, to get a better sense of programming ideas, um, because this kind of goes to the earlier question about um, some of the challenges. In one of the communities where we work with in Clark's Grove, Minnesota, um, it's a, a very diverse community. Um, so there are a lot of immigrants and then there are a lot of veterans. And um, when we surveyed them, the program ideas or interests were very different. Um, so just trying to accommodate the needs of both um, and uh, seeing that, for instance, uh, while some of the um, younger residents were interested in workforce development, um, when we surveyed the older residents, they wanted um, more opportunities for, for connection, for social engagement. Um, so being flexible um, and being open uh, to things that are not necessarily tied to you know, digital literacy or aptitude, that, those types of skills, but um, that are also important for well-being and living a, a, a good quality or having a good quality of life. All right, thank you. Next one, uh, which time of the year would you say is best is the best time to do pop-up libraries or what would be the things to do slash offer during the different times of year? Uh, this varies on climate and where, so where you are, but for instance, in, in Puerto Rico, we, um, we can have our, our ideas box pop-up library open pretty much um, all year, um, but uh, we, uh, we can also adapt, you know, based on the climate, if it's cold, if you want to move things indoors. Um, and what was the second half of the question? I'm sorry, I don't... Oh, it's okay. Um, it was in the Q&A box. Oh, I see. So um, do you have, like, different sort of seasonal activities that vary? Um, yes. I mean, it's very similar to um, the library's uh, seasonal activities in many ways. Um, so we don't have a calendar of events um, that says, you know, in the spring or in the summer or in, in the fall, um, we do X, Y, Z activities. Um, but we find that we typically will hold um, like holiday get togethers at a, a particular time of year and like picnics and town halls in the summer. Um, but there isn't a, a calendar of events um, or activities that go with specific seasons. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I think we have time for two more. So I'm going to ask one first, and then we'll move on to the second one. Uh, but just um, Kat and Aaron, so you're aware when you answer. Um, first question, you mentioned that you help with connectivity. Can you talk briefly about that? Sure. Um, Aaron, I'm, I've noticed I've been dominating. I'm not sure if you want to take this Go one. for it. Go for it. So connectivity, uh, broadband connectivity, I assume is the type of connectivity um, that we we're talking about. Um, we have worked um, with ISPs. Um, we've worked with public libraries and um, other digital inclusion um, organizations uh, to set up connectivity in um, a number of spaces. Um, sometimes that is something that we factor into a budget for, um, or, a, you know, a, a program uh, budget uh, and we're paying, you know, for those costs uh, through that. Sometimes it's provided in kind um, if we're working with an ISP or highly subsidized. Sometimes we're helping folks sign up. So it, it varies um, based on the community, but um, that's, those are some of the ways that we help folks with connectivity. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And then lastly, can you finish us off with, uh, you know, sort of briefly how you build local capacity? Oh, <laughs> briefly. <laughs> um, I know, sorry. <laughs> um, I can answer that in one minute. Um, but um, a lot of what we focus on in terms of building capacity um, is giving folks tools um, for um, human-centered design. Essentially, that's kind of the, the, the shortest way I can answer it. And um, that can involve um, human-centered design to help make a space warm and welcoming. Um, it can be the placemaking rubric that I mentioned. Um, so it gives you a much more formulaic, but um, very um, um, consistently um, 
high quality way to create a community space. Um, it's facilitator trainings. Um, we also host Train the Trainer um, series. Uh, so there are just a, a number of ways that we try to build local capacity. Um, and those are a few of them. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And we are right at the top of the hour. Um, before I just pass it over to Libraries Without Borders and, and Dina to close us out, I just want to um, say that, like Dina mentioned, this is this is my last webinar that I'll be hosting with Connect Home. Um, it's been a great, you know, two years getting to know all of you, some of you I've worked with directly, others, you know, probably just recognize my voice and my email over the last few years, but it really has been a pleasure and I'll, I'll, I'll be around. I won't, I won't be a stranger. So mm -hmm. thanks again for all your work and, you know, wishing, wishing you all the best. And with, with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Aaron or Kat for any closing remarks and then to you, Dina. Um, thank you, sure. thank you, Kayla and Dina. Um, and yes, Kayla, I mean we we've, we've had a chance to work with you, over, and you've been lovely. And I'm sure that you're going to be greatly missed. Erin, um, passing it over to you. Yeah, um, I just want to thank everyone and thank uh, you know Connect Home folks in particular for uh, inviting us to present and to have this conversation. Um, we have worked in so many different kinds of, of places, and we would love to be able to collaborate with you and your housing authority to help to bridge the digital divide and help to bring uh, essential information and services and resources um, to your communities. I think the work that, that we do uh, really transforms spaces and transforms um, people's experience of them, and that uh, can do uh, enormous goods for people of, of all ages and, and backgrounds. So we're really uh, looking forward to, uh, to hearing from you. I think our, our email addresses have been uh, flashed on the, on the screen for the last half hour or so, and do not hesitate to get in touch. I know it's the end of the year, but we, uh, we really want to start getting things going um, for next year as soon as we can. Thank you, Erin and Kat, and that, that's a great way to end us. Um, I think uh, Connect Home USA communities are very well placed to work with Libraries Without Borders. I think you're also going to be very well placed to take advantage of the new funding that's going to be coming down the pike from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and hopefully also from the Build Back Better Act. Um, hopefully that will pass. So um, I want to thank uh, Kat and Aaron for a tremendous presentation. Hopefully, um, not only did they plant some seeds, but hopefully we've planted seeds with you um, in that uh, there, there may, hopefully will be some future collaborations with some of our communities. Uh, and also, before I close, uh, a big thank you again to Kayla and a, a, a warm thank you to all of our communities for the incredible work you do day in and day out, 24-7 um, throughout this pandemic. Um, you have been really remarkable. And so with that, I want to wish you a, a happy and safe holiday season, and I look forward to working with you uh, in the new year. So thanks for joining us, and we will be in touch. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.